Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. Hey, thanks for coming out on this snowy April morning. Like, does it, is this good or what? <laughs> Only in Susquehanna County, right? Is it snowing at the end of April? Well, thank you for coming out this morning. Um, today we're going to have a wonderful program for you. Um, we're going to have, this is Michelle Cassatori, and she's from um, Dare to be Tick Aware, the Pennsylvania Lyme Prevention uh, Organization. And she's going to do a 45-minute presentation for us this morning on ticks and how to prevent, uh, you know, prevention and awareness and how to keep yourself safe and your family and, and your pets safe. Um, so Michelle going to talk to us about that. She's from Dallas, Pennsylvania. She teaches at Medjugorje College. And I'm not sure how long you've been doing this. Twenty-nine years. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming for us today. We appreciate you're here. Um, and then we have Dr. Daniel Cameron coming from Mount Kisco, New York. Uh, he will arrive here shortly. He has about a three and a half hour ride, and he's coming in to speak at eleven o'clock. So we're very grateful, Dr. Cameron's coming down as well. Um, the Tick-Borne Disease Task Force of Susquehanna County started in 2016 when the previous Board of Commissioners decided that we needed to do something about education and awareness in our county because there's such a need for it. So for the last three years, we've been trying to bring events such as this to the county each spring and bringing in very well-known doctors to speak and educate the public. So that's a project. Um, then throughout the summer, we have informational tables at other outings like the Hartford Fair and Wolfstock and the Ag Day at Elk Lake. Just trying to get as much information out there as we can because that's going to be one of the best things we can do is just learn how to protect ourselves. We want everyone to enjoy the great outdoors in our beautiful county, but you just have to be aware, know what to look for, and protect yourself and your children and your pets. So we thank you for coming today, and I would like to also thank the Mountain View School for hosting us today. They have been ever so gracious to us. Uh, George and Joe this morning helping us set up our tables. Am I still on? Um, set up our tables and um, set up our screening and everything for us. We thank you so much, gentlemen, and thank you for your hospitality. And I would also like to thank my TIC task force, the members that are here today. I have Mary Browns. Mary, could you please speak yeah. up? I have Phyllis Constance is here. She's been a member of the task force for three years. Peter Bobbin, he is president of the Southern Tier Lyme Support Group, and we're so happy to have him as part of our team. And Dr. Cameron is also part of our team. And Dr. Clarence Mass is as well, and he's supposed to be here. I hope he arrived. Um, did I miss anyone? I don't think I did. Okay, so thank you, team, for all your help in putting this event and all our events on. And we're so happy to have you here, and let's have a great morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's my volume? Are we good? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much to Commissioner Arnold for inviting me to come here and speak to you today about uh, preventing tick bites and tick-borne diseases. It's something that, you know, means a great deal to me. Um, and as uh, Commissioner Arnold mentioned, I've been involved with the uh, PA Line Resource Network for a number of years now. And this program was developed a couple of years ago and I got certified uh, through that process at the time. So I'm happy to bring this uh, education and awareness out to your community. So let me just proceed here. Um, my introduction. I am required to go through the medical uh, advice disclaimer. The information presented today is for informational purposes only. It is not intended as any legal or medical advice regarding the treatment of any symptoms or diseases. Any information in the presentation or associated material is not intended to take the place of advice from your personal health care provider or other professional advisor. So what will we talk about today? I'm going to be covering things like ticks and their habitat, uh, what are tick-borne diseases, and of course, how to prevent tick, tick bites, what to do if you should get bitten by a tick, and then I do have um, some time slotted in for uh, Q&A, so I ask if you wouldn't mind holding your questions until I'm finished, and then we can go through any questions that you might have. I'd be happy to answer them for you. So um, where this whole program really stemmed from is Pennsylvania had legislation that was launched called Act 83, and it established that tick-borne disease posed a serious health threat uh, to the quality of life of residents and visitors in the state of Pennsylvania. 
And through Act 83, a set of recommendations uh, was delivered to the Secretary of Health and the PA departments and the PA legislature. One of the recommendations included a prevention, education, and awareness program um, aimed to reduce the growing incidence of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. And that is the program that I'll be covering with you today. PA Lyme Resource Network had, had received a grant uh, through the Department of Health to put together this program, and that's the program you'll see. Okay. How many people, this, how many people here have been bitten by ticks? I, I would imagine, yeah, quite a few. And how many of you either have or know someone with Lyme disease? And how about co-infections? Okay. And how many people here practice regular prevention? Okay, yeah, there's always a little less hands at that last question than there were at the first question, um, but hopefully by the time we're done today, everybody's hand will go up for that um, going forward. So Lyme disease truly is the fastest growing disease reported by the CDC. You can see on the bottom we've listed out statistical information of other diseases, and Lyme disease exceeds breast cancer, colon cancer, HIV infection. Um, in 2014-2015, the CDC did a study, and they compared the actual cases of Lyme disease with reported cases. Uh, the reported cases obviously were what was sent into them, and the actual cases, they came to that number by going through lab results that indicated a positive test. They found that uh, Lyme disease was underreported about 10 to 12 times. So they then adjusted their estimated numbers from 30,000 cases of Lyme disease to 300,000 new cases per year. So it really kind of got on everybody's radar that this is a really significant and growing issue. You can see in this picture, it represents the cases from 1996 just through 2015, and I can tell you that um, we are in the process of updating a lot of our statistics, and certainly 2016 saw an increase, as did 2017, another increase. Um, but what's significant about this picture is each blue dot represents a confirmed case of Lyme disease, and you can see the state of Pennsylvania in 1996, and then when you scan over to 2015, you know, you can barely see our state because it's covered in blue. Uh, so, Lyme disease really occurs most, uh, most readily in a cluster of about 14 states in the northeastern region of the United States, and those states are listed there. Um, what I want to point out, what's significant to know, is that Pennsylvania leads the nation and truly, really far exceeds the other states, because if you added together the confirmed cases of New York and New Jersey together, you would still get a lower number than the confirmed cases we have in Pennsylvania. So it's, it's truly a significant amount. These are some of the hot spots that are uh, reported per incidence, which is per 100,000. So you can kind of see these are our counties. Um, some are, are lit up more than others. But one thing that you should know overall is that every county has reported cases of Lyme disease. So wherever you travel throughout Pennsylvania, you are certainly in a county that has occurrences of Lyme disease and, and other tick-borne diseases as well. The most at-risk uh, groups, children ages 5 to 15 are a very high-risk group in our state. They spend a lot of time outdoors. They're doing outdoor activities. Um, sports really are occurring pretty much all year round anymore for children, so they do spend a lot of time outdoors. And then adults ages 40 to 55 are another really high at-risk group, potentially because they're outside watching their children play all those sports. They're taking care of property, they're gardening, they're, you know, you have a lot of work when you own property at home and you're maintaining your lawn, so you spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, what's not on this slide, but is of course kind of goes without saying, is that anyone who spends a significant amount of time outdoors, whether you're an outdoor worker, whether you're an outdoor recreationalist, you are going to be at a higher risk. So, Something to know about Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases is that they really are emerging quite rapidly. There are several diseases besides Lyme disease that you can contract from a single tick bite. We refer to ticks as nature's dirty little needle because a single bite can carry multiple types of bacteria and viruses and protozoan. Um, at our table outside, there's uh, the tick ID cards, and you'll see this uh, if you come by. They're free. You can grab one of these. And it highlights just the top three ticks that we have, certainly have many more in the state of Pennsylvania, and the various diseases that they carry. So let's talk a little bit about ticks and their habitat. Well, ticks are, uh, are an ectoparasite, so that means that they feed on the outside of their host. 
So when they're taking that blood meal, um, you, that's why they're still on the outside of, your, of, of our body. They're in the arachnid family, which is the spider family, and you can see they have eight legs like a spider. And I'll talk a few slides ahead uh, about how they utilize those legs um, in order to quest. There's the uh, deer tick, which is the black-legged tick. It's now found in every state. And the tick has four life stages, egg, larva, nymph, and adult, which I will talk about those life stages, again, coming up a little bit later on. Um, they're found in temperate areas, regions that typically have four seasons, which I think we've had two seasons already today, literally, <laughs> just since I left my house. So uh, we're certainly in, a, in that climate that's right for your face. Um, these next few slides just really show the distribution of these particular types of ticks where they're most prevalent. You can see, what I point out to people as, I'm, as I flip through these next few slides is, you can see our state is completely covered. So we've got these ticks in our state. We kind of, we know we have ticks. Uh, this is the black-legged deer tick, the American dog tick, the lone star tick, which is the tick you see the female has the white spot on her back. What I want to point out is that this is the tick that causes that meat allergy, and you've heard about that in the past few years. Um, this particular tick has a sugar in their saliva called alpha-gal, and it's the same um, sugar that's present in mammal meat, so it can trigger an allergic reaction to red meat. So it's definitely something that if you have a potential exposure, and you may have gotten bit by this tick, and perhaps you didn't even know. <coughs> and then if you start to feel sick, and then perhaps you all of a sudden have this strange allergic reaction to red meat that you never had before, um, that might be helpful information to recall that you may have been exposed to a bite by the Lone Star tick. Uh, this is distribution of the brown dog tick, which of course is found broadly throughout the U.S. Um, one of the things about the brown dog tick that we just make note of is that unlike other ticks, it's not just found in the woods and the forest. This is a tick that can infest your home. Um, you know, if your dog was boarded or or cat or came, came in from outside and had a brown dog tick on it, the tick may fall off the dog and embed in perhaps your couch or, or cracks or crevices throughout throughout your home, and they can lay a lot of eggs, and they can survive in that environment. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about where you may find ticks. Um, a lot of times, people just think about this picture, which is very woodsy. Um, it's kind of you know cluttered with downed branches and um, even some, some weeds and things like that. But a point to know is that ticks are found in tall grass, and, and it doesn't have to be like waist-high grass. I'm talking, you know, when we let our grass in the summer, I, once I cut the grass once, it's like I can cut it every other day sometimes. It's, it feels like it just grows so quickly. So taller grass, any type of thick brush, um, certainly woods, which we know, along forest edges. You know, we, we carve into the forest edges, and with a lot of properties, very beautiful um, properties, are, are outlined by forest edges. And that can be a really high potential tick habitat. So that's something important to be aware of. Um, stone walls are another area because mice tend to make nests and homes within stone walls, and we'll talk a little bit about what impact mice have on the whole Lyme disease issue, um, but stone walls are certainly an area that are potential for tick habitats. Leaf litter piles, um, we've been still cleaning up leaf litter around our house. Uh, I thought I got it all, and then we had a lot of wind, and I got outside the next morning, and there was all the leaves again, like curled up in those certain spots on my property. So we're out there cleaning them up again. Um, and you know, it wasn't really that cold, or it wasn't really that warm when we were doing it, but those are the days where you have to remember to practice prevention because there could be ticks in that leaf litter pile. Uh, down wood, if you're cleaning areas, I, throughout our neighborhood with the, some of the heavy winds and things we've had, there have been a lot of people that had downed trees and branches and people are out doing a lot of cleanup and picking up. So again, that's an opportunity to remember to practice your prevention. Um, and then, of course, at the bases of trees, these are some other potential pictures. There was a study done in California, I want to say it was in 2010, that indicated a significant number of nymphal ticks living on the underside of older um, wooden park <coughs> benches and picnic tables, uh, you know, because it retains some moisture. Ticks need moisture to live, and we'll talk a little bit about that, because we can kind of use that as a prevention tool as well, knowing that they need moisture. Um, there was also a study done that showed a significant number of nymphal ticks living on, on the underside of those big mossy rocks. Again, a nice moisture uh, rich area for ticks. So it's just something to consider because those are spots that if you're taking a walk that you think, oh, I'll pop down on this large mossy comfortable stone or this old wooden you know, picnic bench. 
So it's just something to be aware of. So let's talk now about tick behavior. So ticks cannot jump, they do not fly, they don't actually have eyes, so they're not seeing <coughs> us. They detect our carbon dioxide, body odors, heat, vibration, up to about 50 feet away. So they're sensing our presence in that way. Um, and different ticks have different behaviors. Now, I love these two slides. The top slide really indicates ticks do tend to hang out in clusters. So I tell people that. So remember when you're doing your tick checks. If you find one tick, don't stop looking. Like, don't assume, like, oh, I found it. It's, it's gone. I'm, now I'm at zero. Because you may have gotten exposed to more than one tick, and they might not be in the same spot on your body. So just bear that in mind. You see the kind of the cluster picture. Um, the, the top picture and the bottom picture really illustrate the questing behavior of a tick. So their back legs, those bottom legs, are kind of attached to the blade of grass or the twig, and those top legs are in this open position. And this is called questing. So as you walk by, they might latch on to your pant leg, your sock, your shoe, your pet, um, your child. So they latch on, and they're not instantly going to bite you. So we're going we're to think about that, because time is another thing that we can kind of utilize. Um, but you'll see in future slides, most of, and I don't know where you all found ticks on your body, but I bet all of you, you know, I'm sure 100% of you didn't find them on your ankle. You know, you may, some people may have had some, but they're not necessarily biting you right then as soon as they latch on. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, now there's another type of behavior that ticks, like the lone star tick, the one with the white dot, the one that can prompt a meat allergy. The way that tick um, quests is a little different. Uh, they, they do the questing, but they're also more of a hunter tick. So that particular tick, if it senses your carbon dioxide, body odor, heat vibration, will come down off that perch and sort of track you for maybe about 20, 25 feet. So, you know, this is the tick that perhaps if you are taking a hike or walking along, you know, a nature trail and you decide that you've got this great photo opportunity and really to get it best, you know, you send the people you're taking pictures of deep into the, you know, into the brush there to get the right skyline and get the right photo op, um, you know, that gives, potentially gives that tick a little bit of time to come down off that perch and track you a little bit. So just again, bear in mind that different ticks behave differently. The Lone Star tick being a more aggressive tick in terms of a hunting type nature. Um, ticks quest basically where they live. So anywhere you're going to find ticks living, you will find ticks questing. The life cycle. So they live about two years. I've actually um, heard recently that it's more, it can even be up to like two and a half years or so. So that tells you, you know, ticks are living through the winter. They're not all dead and gone in the winter, okay? They're out there. Um, what they need to transition to each of these life stages is a blood meal. So they're not like foraging on, you know, grass or other insects. They just need a blood meal at each life stage to transition into that next life stage. So, um, so the dangerous months are, are kind of where we're at now. We're heading right in the middle of it. Um, they're out all year long, but in that April through you know August range, the nymphal ticks, which are those very, very small ticks, and I do have some tick samples with me today, so if anybody's interested in seeing them, if you didn't already, you can stop by the table. I'm happy to show you um, what they look like, because if you think you know the size of a nymphal tick, I'll show you one. And you, it's, if, you're, if you're not sure, it's astounding truly how small that they are. Um, and it can be a little bit misleading because as they get engorged, they get a little bigger um, and they change their look. So always I tell people when you, when you remove a tick, don't just assume it was definitely a dog tick or some other a brown tick or, and, and be not concerned about it. You should save that tick and we'll talk about why as I go through the presentation. But it's important to recognize that no month is a zero risk month for ticks. No month, even through the winter, even when there's snow on the ground, the snow acts as an insulator and those female ticks can survive under that snow. And then when we have, you know, December, January, February, occasionally those warm days where the patches of snow or so you can start to see little peaks of, of grass coming through, you decide, you know, we all have faculty who can't wait to get outside, take the dog out. Are we practicing prevention at that point? You know, Probably not. A lot of people aren't thinking about it. It's winter. Um, but those adult female deer ticks can certainly be coming out to quest at that time. 
I had someone call me in February and say, I just took two ticks off myself. I just took the dog for a walk. And that happens. That happens. So you've got to practice prevention. Um, tick size and engorgement. So ticks can feed for more than five days. A lot of people don't realize that. They don't just you know, bite you and take off. Um, they prefer a slow blood meal. They will linger and stay on you uh, for days, truly. So the other thing I advise is when you think you've been outside in the potential tick habitat exposure and you come in and you do your first round tick check, if you don't find a tick, a tick at that point, I encourage people to keep an eye on themselves for a few days and still be looking. Because um, ticks will become engorged as they feed. That, that means they get larger because they're taking in your blood, so they're engorging. Um, now, if you want to catch them and get them removed as soon as possible. But I encourage people to keep looking because if you miss it on day one, you know, maybe you'll catch it on day two. So just keep checking and don't assume that, you know, as soon as you come in, if you check, you're done, they're gone, and there could be any on you. They will stay on you if, if not found. Uh, a couple of myths and facts to, to know about. Um, a myth is that deer are the primary culprit. Um, deer are really, they're tick taxis, essentially. Um, a deer can have, you know, a few hundred ticks on them, um, and they're carrying them. Think about the mileage that the deer puts off, right? So they are loaded up with ticks. Um, they amplify the tick population because they're a great blood meal source for the ticks. So maybe you have deer that come along your property line, and it's beautiful, and, and maybe they're you know bending their head down to nibble on some um, if you've got some um, some ground covering things that are you know that, that deer like to eat. But just know that they could be also dropping off ticks along that part of your property line as well. Um, what you want to know is that deer don't give ticks Lyme disease; they're just the host that they feed on. You're not going to get Lyme disease from eating deer meat. Um, Mice are the real culprits here because mice and other small mammals are the ones who infect the ticks. The ticks aren't born with Lyme disease. Um, at that larval stage, they take their first blood meal typically from a very small mammal like a mouse, a chipmunk, a, a squirrel, maybe, maybe some rabbits, you know, something small. And they get infected at that point. That's how they get the Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes the Lyme disease, and several other types of bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, which we'll talk about. So at that point, they have become infected, and then when they're a nymphal tick, which is the season we're heading into right now, those very small, easy to miss ticks, their next blood meal may be you or I, maybe our dog, our cat, our child. So why the increase? I was talking to somebody um, out in the hallway about this, um, because I, I know, I mean, I, I grew up, I was an outdoor kid. I mean, we were outside all of the time. And I, to my knowledge, I don't ever recall having a tick bite on me. If I did, I, I, I don't recall ever being sick. Um, and now it's just so, so, so prevalent. And there's a lot of theories. It's a very complex question, I'll be honest. There's no one single answer to this question. But some of the points to know are things like <coughs> temperature shifts. I mentioned that ticks survive through the winter. You know, um, think about their life cycle. So if our winters aren't as cold, as deep a freeze for a prolonged period of time, they're less likely to kill off a significant number of ticks. We've also had a lot more of that residential sprawl. Um, you know, we're developing a lot of, uh, well, residential developments. We're carving into the forest. We're building things up. Beautiful, nice communities, wonderful areas. But in the process, we are fragmenting the forest, which chases out the fox which is a natural predator of the mouse. And now you know the role of mice in the whole existence of Lyme disease. So when you have a really high population of mice and you don't have a high biodiverse area where you've got natural predators of the mouse, then you know the mice are kind of living large and they're infecting more and more and more ticks. So that's part of the role as well. So now we'll touch base on the tick-borne diseases. Lyme, which of course is the most well-known, um, when I ask that first question, or second question technically, who you know, here has had or knows someone who's had Lyme disease, I think almost every hand was raised. Um, so most of you probably are familiar with the fact that Lyme disease was discovered in, in Lyme, Connecticut in the 70s, but now it's found all throughout the northeastern United States. Um, but what you might not know is that uh, there are many co-infections that you can get from a single tick bite. And that's where the tick ID card comes in and it lists out 
um, some of which are bacterial, some are viral, and some are protozoan. Some of the symptoms mimic that of Lyme, and others have some very distinct symptoms of their own that um, certainly uh, practitioners and healthcare providers who are very knowledgeable about tick-borne diseases can help differentiate what those symptoms are, particularly for someone who has gone through a course of treatment for Lyme disease and is still not well. You know, it could be that you contracted something in addition to the Lyme disease that might need to be addressed. And it might need to be addressed by a different, um, by a different approach, you know, uh, you know, antimicrobials, for example, for example, or an antiviral, or something that might be slightly different than the, the typical traditional approach for just that acute Lyme disease. And that's something to discuss with your healthcare provider. So how is all this transmitted? So it's, it's actually interesting to me, the whole, the whole Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, it's really pretty scientifically interesting. Um, if it wasn't so life-destructive for, for people who get ill, um, it's really kind of a fascinating um, type of bacteria. But um, the way it works is a tick will latch on, and then, as I mentioned earlier, they like moisture. They need moisture to survive. They like warm, moist environments. So think back to where you may have removed ticks off of yourself or a child or a friend, the neighbor, whomever. Um, they're seeking out those warm, moist areas on your body. So they may latch on at the lower portion of your leg, and then they'll kind of begin this slow ascent. They might choose behind the knee, the groin, under the breast line, the armpit, along the hairline, those warm, kind of sweaty, moist areas of your body. Uh, once they find the area that's appealing to them, they'll secrete in their, in their mouth, they'll secrete a little numbing agent, which is why you don't feel a tick bite in the same way that you feel a mosquito bite you're a little numb. Um, they'll insert their feeding tube, which has tiny little barbs on it, so it sort of anchors in there a bit. And then they also secrete another substance that's like a cement-like substance. So it kind of seals that point of contact. So now they're kind of anchored in there, and then they'll begin that slow blood meal. And that's how the process takes place. Now, in, in that, I mentioned time being a factor that we can kind of utilize that to, to our advantage as long as we're vigilant about checking, okay? Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the Lyme bacteria, takes about 18 to 24 hours for transmission. Rickettsia rickettsi requires six hours. Powassan virus only takes 15 minutes. And Powassan virus can be quite nasty and can make you quite sick very quickly. Um, so those are all points to know. And you really want to be aware of, of time being of the essence because the longer the tick is on you, the greater your exposure risk to a variety of bacteria and viruses. So the quicker you're finding the tick and getting it removed, the, the less risk of multiple disease transmission you're at. And again, they're very easy to miss. So that's why I come back to the point of saying, check, recheck, recheck. Because if that tick is on you and feeding, you might not catch it at, in hour one or two, but maybe you'll catch it at hour 10 or 12. You know, so just keep looking. That one we'll cover. So now we're going to talk about preventing tick bites. Because now you understand where ticks live, where you might be exposed. You understand how they feed on you, right? And you understand that the whole time, the engorgement, you understand there are different ticks. They carry a lot of different diseases. So now it's really important to figure out, all right, well, what do I do then? You know, because we still go outside all the time. I would never discourage my children from going outside and playing. I would never discourage them from participating in the sports that they love so much. My husband and I love to garden. Um, we're outside a lot. So I would not encourage people to, to hold up inside their home. Um, there are things you can do to be proactive um, and really focus on prevention. So, dressing for protection, we're going to start with that point. Out at my table, I have a sample of a, a bottle uh, spray. It's called permethrin. And if, if you all are outdoor people, you may have heard of permethrin. Some of you may use permethrin. I know I talked to a few people that do. Um, permethrin is a chemical, and you can use it to treat your shoes or your clothing. You cannot spray it directly on yourself. Um, permethrin, I believe, originally was just made and used for military, um, and then it became commercially available some years later. 
Uh, you can get it at places like Lowe's and Home Depot. You can get it at camping equipment stores. They frequently sell it. You can treat your, um, your tents, your camping equipment. You can treat your dog beds or your dog blanket. You know, if you have a hunting dog and maybe you have a, a blanket that you throw in the, in the car or the truck when you take the dog out, um, you can treat that blanket. I treat my dog beds. Um, but you just want to please be sure that you read the label and you understand the safe measures to take when you're going to be treating things with permethrin. Just please understand that. Um, you do not spray it directly on your skin. You want to do it in a well-ventilated area. Um, another option to clothing protection is that uh, there's a company called Insect Shield. Um, and I probably at this point should just mention to everybody that I don't sell any of these products. I don't get any uh, money from people buying these products. These are, we share this for, for educational purposes so that you have some ideas and samples of what you can, of what you can consider purchasing. Um, but Insect Shield is a company, and I have a couple of those samples out of my table as well. They will sell pre-treated socks. They have some pre-treated like legging type pants and uh, bandanas. Those are the, the samples I have. Um, but you can also send in to Insect Shield your own clothing in a pack. If you've got, you know, your hunting outfit that you always wear, you've got your, you know, favorite fishing stuff that you're always putting on, your gardening clothes that you always wear. I mean, my husband has kind of his set gardening stuff because it's so filthy he can't wear it anywhere else. So, you know, he's got that. You can send that in. Um, I don't know the exact cost, but they will treat it with the permethrin for you. Send it back. Clothing that's treated, it's good for 70 washings. So that's pretty good mileage, you know, to cover a season of gardening or a season of hunting or fishing. So it's certainly something to consider. Um, treating your socks and shoes alone with permethrin can reduce your risk by about 74 times. Now again, that's not, that is not 100%. So I, I tell people, through all these prevention techniques, which can be very effective, you're not going to have 100% protection, so those tick checks are still important. Um, but treating your clothing is an option. The next thing you're going to do is then treat any bare skin. Um, and let me say at this point, the, the least bare skin, the less bare skin, the better. So we do encourage people when you're going to be outside, wear <coughs> long pants. Consider tucking your pants in your socks. Wear long shirts. Wear a hat. Um, you know, and it's not a favorite thing, especially for kids in the summer when they're going outside and be told, oh, put your long sleeve shirt on. Oh, put your long pants on. Um, I have trouble getting my kids to do that. But just point to know that, you know, decreasing the skin exposure is going to decrease opportunity for bite. So just keep that in mind. Um, any exposed skin you want to treat with a repellent. Permethrin will kill. Okay, that's why you don't spray it on yourself. It's a clothing, it's used on clothing or gear. The second line of defense is your repellent, which is safe to put on your skin. There are a couple of options. There are chemical-based repellents like DEET, which most people have probably heard of. I have a sample of that out of the table as well. What I like to remind people of is that there are different percent recommendations of DEET for children versus adults. So please always, always read your label and understand the percentage of DEET that you're using if you're going to spray yourself and then spray a child. Okay, just understand that. The other thing to know is the length of protection you have from repellents. It doesn't mean that you can spray um, you know, your child at 7 a.m. and if they're going on a field trip that they're going to be gone all day long, they're not still going to be protected at you know, 4 or 5 o'clock. So just look at the length of time that you're getting protection from. The other option is a non-chemical option. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, lemon eucalyptus is an example of that. I have a sample of that out of the table. There are some cedar oil sprays that are natural repellents as well. Um, there are some good studies to support the use of those natural options as long as the percentage of the oil is at the right concentration to offer a good amount of repellent. Uh, you also, again, always want to understand the length of time you've got protection for when you're using a repellent. But there are plenty of options. Um, Avon has the bug off, I have a sample of that as well, with Picard, and that's a repellent. Um, and they have a spray or they have wipes. They come in a little packet, and you just tear over the packet, and you kind of wipe it around some of the exposed areas. Great to throw in a backpack, your pocket, your purse. If you're going to be outside, take it with you and maybe reapply. So something to consider. It really doesn't take that long to utilize these prevention techniques. I, I mentioned that um, once a month I pull out all our shoes. If you drove by my house, like I try to do it the first week of every month, 
every shoe we have, the dog beds, the blanket, you know, it's all laid out. Um, I'm spraying with permethrin. Inside my house, uh, we have like our back door that leads to the yard where, you know, the kids are kind of coming through going outside. Everybody knows in my house, that's where I keep my, my repellent. And anybody's welcome to use it. So if you're coming in my house and you're going to go out into my backyard, it's right at the door. So just spray it on. It doesn't take long. It really does not take long. Now we're going to talk a little bit about property prevention, uh, yard prevention. As I mentioned earlier, ticks need moisture to live, so we're going to use that. Um, so let the sun shine in, you know. Um, I know that it, it sounds nice to sit under a nice shady tree and have your bench there, have your swing set there, the play set, right? Um, but just bear in mind that if you can get more sun exposure and more heat, you're going to reduce the, the um the welcoming of the ticks because they don't really like that type of environment so much. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're going through your property. Keep your grass cut short. You know, again, taller grass is going to attract more ticks. So keep your grass cut short. Um, consider where you're putting the, that play equipment. Consider using bark or chips versus mass planting, depending on the mass planting that you're choosing. Some There's some vegetation that attract deer and attract mice and attract ticks, um, and there are others that, that don't. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're making some choices as, as well. Um, you know, property line, you, you might want to consider having an outline breaking up that forest edge and then the area of your yard where you spend your time or your children or your pets are outside. Um, it's actually Alaskan yellow cedar, not Atlantic yellow cedar, but those chips, because I mentioned cedar being a natural repellent, um, you can use that. We use that in our uh, area in the back there, and uh, I've been happy with that. So that's more of a repellent, and you can use that as an option, as opposed to even building a stone wall, because now you know that that might attract mice. Um, you can also do timed targeted spraying. And again, there are always two options. You have the chemical options, and there are, I know there are companies that will come and treat your lawn um, with insect repellents. Just know, I always just encourage everybody, ask those people those questions. What, what chemical are you using? What's the risk factors for my pet, my kids, my garden, um, my water supply? Just ask those questions and, and be aware, okay? Uh, the other option are the natural organic sprays. There's a product called um, Yard Guard. It's a cedar side. That was what our picture was supposed to be. That just shows cedar oil, but there's actually a product called Yard Guard. That's, I, I like that, it's my own personal preference. Attach it right onto the garden hose and just spray it through the yard. It's natural, let's say, if I have kids, I have dogs, I have a great nephew that comes over, so I try to uh, be cautious about what I'm using on the property. But we recommend considering doing it three times a year, May, June, and October, because again, ticks are out all year, and uh, you have to understand the length of protection you're getting. If you're having someone come and treat your yard and they tell you, hey, this will be good for 12 months, then you're good for 12 months. Um, we treat our yard at least twice a year, if not three times a year, um, with the natural option. There's another product called Tick Tubes. Um, there's a company called Daminex that makes them for you. But I can tell you that they're pretty easy to make yourself if you're, if you're inclined to do so. You can use... Um, Toilet paper rolls, you can use PVC piping, any tube type substance. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to put cotton or your lint from your dryer or your dryer sheets or anything like that. You're going to treat that with permethrin first and you're going to stuff it into these tubes and you're going to place these tubes around your property where you think you have an issue with mice. Because again, you know that the white footed mouse is a culprit and a white footed mouse can have 100 ticks on it. So, uh, you know, you definitely, and if they're feeding on that mouse, they're likely the ticks that got infected. So if you can reduce the population of mice, you can reduce your risk. So these are a nice uh, option for doing that. You also want to consider your pets, um, because not only might, might the dog get sick, but also the dog or the cat can bring in a tick, if it's an indoor-outdoor pet, they can bring in a tick that comes off the dog and cat and comes on to you. Um, I've got three dogs and two cats. Um, the cats are indoor, but the dogs are, of course, inside and outside. And they jump off the couch. They, I mean, they'll nuzzle up and sleep with you um, any chance they get. So I encourage people to talk to your vet because there are many great products out there for pet protection. Um, they've got collars. They've got drops. 
Um, they've got, you know, like topical things, they have vaccines. So talk to your vet, be sure that you're making the best selection for your pet. Your vet understands your, your pet's health, their size, you know, the weight you want, that plays into the type of chemical you're going to be using, the type of product. So talk to your vet. Um, you can consider pre-treating your blankets with permethrin. Cats, there is no significant evidence of cats getting Lyme disease. But if you have an indoor-outdoor cat, they can bring ticks in. So just know that. Um, and also just point to know that permethrin can be fatal to cats if it's not dry. But as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to handle that permethrin because you don't get that on your skin. It's got to be dry. So just understand you're not going to be bringing that stuff into your house until it's dry. Um, avoiding tick habitats. Now, I always say, and I mentioned it earlier, is do not feel that you need to stay inside. <laughs> Go outside. What we're saying here is be aware, be careful. When you're kneeling down in the brush, when you're sitting, when you're crawling, when you're gardening, when you're walking along trails, when you're taking those photos and you decide to back up a little bit, get over to that rock, get over through that tall grass, that's so pretty, um, it's fine. But be aware, be aware, and make sure that you're practicing prevention, okay? So it doesn't mean stay inside, it just means be smart, avoid what you can. Another great thing to do when you come in after a potential risk exposure, is get your clothes off and throw them in the dryer for 10 minutes on the high heat. Don't wash them first, just throw them right in the dryer. Because again, remember we said earlier, now we know ticks need moisture to live. They're not going to survive in the dryer on high heat for 10 minutes. So there you go. It's a great, it's a great prevention opportunity. Get the clothes off and throw them right in the dryer. The kids, same thing, right in the dryer. While they're in the dryer, hop in the shower. Rinse off. Because any tick, as I said earlier, they're latching on low, they're making their way up your body, they're finding their, their spot that they want. That's an opportunity to rinse off any tick that has not been already attached. So they'll fall off in the shower if they're not attached. So that's the second thing you're gonna do. And then the third thing you're gonna do is make sure you're doing tick checks. This, these two pictures really illustrate kind of the most common areas where you're finding the tick bites. And as you can see, we don't have to put an ankle highlighter. Um, so these are the areas you really want to be checking. Encourage your children to check or help them check. A lot of, I did a presentation at a camp last summer and I, the little kids, I said to them, when you come in, check your freckles. If you've got a few more freckles that you didn't have when you went outside and if they're moving, make sure you're telling someone. Um, so, you know, whatever technique, whatever approach, the best way to communicate that to the little ones, but just be sure that they're getting checked. And then eliminate the tick correctly. So you want to use um, a very sharp pointed tweezer, or we have some tick tool samples up at the tables. You want to use those, get as close to the skin and the head of the tick as you can, and lift straight up. Do not twist the tick, burn the tick, squeeze the tick. Don't put things on the tick. I've heard a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, I put peppermint oil on and they don't like that, so they, they'll back out, you don't even have to pull them out. I can tell you that before the tick backs out of you, it will regurgitate, throw up, essentially, okay? And when that happens, your exposure risk just went incredibly high, irregardless of the length of time that tick was on you. Because Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, lives in the belly of the tick. Powassan virus, which we know can be transmitted in 15 minutes, lives in the mouth. So if you have not had the tick on you that long, you may not have been exposed to the line at that point. But if you start pulling, putting things on that tick and upsetting that tick and it regurgitates in you, guess what? The belly contents of that tick are in your bloodstream. So that's why it's really important. I'm not, you know, because I had people tell me, no, I've seen it, it backed out, but it was irritating at the time. So that's not helpful. Um, you want to save the tick. These are some samples of tick removal tools. You want to save the tick. Um, you can put it in a little baggie on a cotton ball. I always tell people, if you're going on a camping trip or you're going outside or you're an outdoor worker, keep a little kit with you. Make sure you've got a tick removal tool, tick removal tool a baggie, obviously, make sure you've got your repellent, right, um, to reapply. Uh, a little cotton ball, if you get the end, some antiseptic or, or um, uh, sanitizer of some sort. After you remove the tick, you're going to clean the area off, okay? But you're going to save that tick, and particularly now, because um, the Tick Research Lab of Pennsylvania, which is based out of East Stroudsburg Wildlife DNA Lab, got a grant, and they are now providing free tick testing to any resident of Pennsylvania. So for free, you can drive there and drop your tick off, you can mail your tick in, and 
within 72 hours, they will come back to you and tell you what type of tick. They can tell you how long the tick was on you based on a scoodle index measurement that they utilize for engorgement size. And they will test the tick for Lyme and a few of the other um, co-infections that you can be at risk for, which are on this card. So it's a great, great resource for us as residents of PA, and I encourage everybody to please take advantage of it. Even if you take a tick off your pet, you can send it in. Okay, you can. It's also really, really helpful because if you should become ill, and let's just say, as we know, the test for Lyme disease may or may not be accurate for you, it may come up negative, and in fact, you may have the disease. If you can go to your healthcare provider and say, I got bit by a tick, I removed it this day, the tick tests positive for Lyme and Babesia, or Lyme and Bartonella, whatever the case might be, here are my symptoms, here is how I'm feeling. Um, hopefully, that healthcare provider provider will recognize and be comfortable to make a clinical diagnosis and, and perhaps initiate treatment for you. So it's very valuable information. Um, and at the very least, it's valuable information for us as a state to be gathering that research information. Because I want to know what these ticks in our state are carrying. And I want to know what counties are most infected. And I want to know what types of ticks are out there. So the more we send in, the more they can share with us. <coughs> what to do if you get bit. Um, some early signs of Lyme disease, headache, hearing loss, muscle soreness. You may or may not have that bullseye rash. You may or may not. It is not an, it is not an absolute that everybody gets it. If you do get the bullseye rash, it is, a, it is an absolute positive that it's uh, Lyme disease and you should absolutely go and begin treatment. Um, as Lyme progresses, there are early localized symptoms. There are early disseminated symptoms. You might start to have joint pain. This is where you know you have a sore knee and you're not really sure why or what went on there. And then maybe a couple weeks later, it's your elbow, maybe your shoulder. I don't know what I did. Um, you know, headaches. It's like, gosh, I've been living on Advil for the past few weeks. You know, what's going on? Um, I'm not sleeping well, so I'm tired. Um, I guess that's why I'm so tired all the time. I'm not sleeping well. Why am I not sleeping well? Maybe you're waking up with sweats. That can, that can really become debilitating as well. Um, Bell's palsy, that facial droop. Um, obviously, if it has been ruled out that you are not having a stroke, of course, um, you know, why would you be getting Bell's palsy? You know, you want to be considering the, the possibility of a, of a tick-borne disease, of exposure. Um, you can begin as the disease starts to disseminate and become more persistent to have issues with cognitive problems. Cardiac complications are absolutely an issue um, related to Lyme disease, and there's a lot of research on that, and it is absolutely something that needs to be addressed. Um, these are just some examples of bullseye rashes, some typical, some atypical. Um, this particular slide, I have this blown up out on my board, that bottom right, that, that's a two-year-old, and that rash kind of went all through her, her hairline. Um, I don't know, if, if I didn't know what I know now, I don't know that I would have saw that and thought, oh, that's a bullseye rash. I don't know that I would have, you know, so I like to kind of point that out. That middle bottom slide does not mean that that person got bit four times by four ticks in that exact spot, okay? Your skin is the first system that is infected with that barrelia, and your skin is a system. So, you know, you might have a rash. You might have a rash near the bite. You might not have a rash near the bite. You might have a rash somewhere else. You might have multiple rashes. Um, they may not look like the classic bullseye. 53% of patients with persistent symptoms also reported co-infection that was confirmed through laboratory testing. So the point to this is to know that if you've been infected with Lyme disease, it's certainly quite likely that you also were infected with a co-infection, especially because we know that Lyme takes a little longer than some of the others. So um, depending on what that tick was carrying, you certainly could have contracted something in addition to Lyme disease, and it should absolutely be considered in your treatment because it might, different infections may need different courses of treatment. They may need different lab tests to help pinpoint what's going on. So it's really, really important to track your symptoms and talk to your healthcare provider. You know, hopefully you're involved with a provider that's really recognizing what you're telling them and listening to your symptoms and is aware of the, the wide variety of symptoms that can occur with tick-borne illness. This is just a sample slide of a, of a Bartonella rash. Looks a lot like stretch marks. Sometimes they're dark, sometimes they're not. This may kind of come and go as well, which is very classic, you know, with Lyme disease. A lot of the symptoms are waxing and waning, so you feel kind of bad, 
And then you, you're ready to call a doctor, and then you're like, I feel okay. I guess whatever that was went away. But then a couple weeks later, you, if you don't feel bad again, and you're like, I, I don't know, I just don't feel well. And then you feel okay again. And then you don't feel well. And then you start having joint pain. And then it just progresses and progresses. Um, so Lyme, when Lyme's considered co-infections, should be considered, as I mentioned, different infections, different tests. Different infections, different treatments. Um, if you, you know your body, right? You know. So if you've got some new onset symptoms and something isn't right, please talk to your healthcare provider. Remember, 50% of the time, people don't even recall a tick bite. They don't find the tick. It's the tick that you didn't find that can make you sick. Um, and 50% of the time, people don't ever get a rash. So don't just wait for the rash and say, I guess I'm okay, I didn't get a rash. That's not the case. So really what I want everybody to, to know is that tick-borne diseases, yes, they can have serious health consequences, including cognitive and psychiatric issues. So catching the disease early is the best opportunity. Um, children are a high-risk group. But please understand and re remember what we talked about today, that you can prevent, you can reduce your risk, okay? So that's, that's the biggest takeaway from what I represent here today, is practice regular prevention. Be vigilant about it. Does anybody have any questions? Or I know we have, uh, Dr. Cameron is going to be speaking. <coughs> what a fabulous opportunity to have him here to speak. Uh, does anybody have any specific questions for me? I order mine online. Um, I, I'm not like an online person anymore, but they, they do carry things like that. And, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Could you repeat the question? Oh, yes. The question was where, where do I get the yard guard? So I just order it online, but you can, um, I'm sure places carry those natural options as well. They're, they're getting very, very popular now as well. Was there another question? Yeah. You had a, the, the one just before this, down at the bottom, I had a www. What's the rest of the Oh, let me see if I can go back there. Oh, PALine.org. Yeah, that's our, that's our website. And I actually have a sign-up sheet uh, at my table. If anyone is interested, if you have an email, uh, if you put your name down and your email address, I'll pass it on and you'll receive emails from the PALine <coughs> Resource Network. We don't completely inundate you, I promise. But uh, we send out, we have a, a newsletter called Line Bites, and we send it out. We try to send it out quarterly. And we also try to send out new information when it comes our way. So if you're interested, you can sign up at the table. <coughs> Somebody else have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Andrade's has a very good organic product. Where's that? Andrade's in Montrose. Oh, okay. So in Montrose, they have a good product. Is that a yard product? It is. It okay, is great. A yard house perimeter. Product. Okay, great. So that's great to know. It's called Eco Guard. Eco Guard. Okay, great. That's good for sharing that. Yes. After you've had Lyme disease. Can that gener degenerate into Alzheimer's? There's definitely, I mean, that's probably a better question for Dr. Cameron when he speaks, but there's definitely literature out there and research out there, and certainly cases where, um, you know, Alzheimer's, it, it was determined that the person had Lyme disease, and when they treated the Lyme disease, the, the Alzheimer's. Chris Christopherson is an example of that. He's, he's a musician, if anybody has ever read his story, but he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and was very, very... Um, cognitively impaired for a while, and then it was determined that he had Lyme disease, and he was treated for his Lyme disease, and I just went and saw him in concert a couple of weeks ago, and he was fabulous. He's 82. He's 82, by the way. It was great. Did you have a question, Matt? Yeah. Uh, I've always heard that ticks can drop down from trees onto you. How high up off the ground do they live? Uh, my, my understanding through this whole educational process is that they live mostly within, like, two feet of the ground. That's my understanding. Now that's not to say that they couldn't drop from somewhere if they somehow got up there, but they're really not climbers and they don't fly. They end up up top on our bodies oftentimes because they make their way up there and or they come off a pet, you know, when you're kind of cleaning your pet or nuzzling up a little bit or you're down low gardening, uh, it's, a, it's a much shorter distance. So I think I don't want to take up more than my share of time, so I know we need to move on, but maybe one more question. Let me, I'll, I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, what is the name of the lab where you can send the ticks in? The, the Tick Research Lab of Pennsylvania, it's associated with East Stroudsburg University Wildlife DNA Lab. And they're, they really do great work there. And they've been doing research on ticks in our state for a long time, and they've offered tick testing. But <coughs> through the process of getting that grant, they can now offer free tick testing to the residents, which is like 
fantastic. Fantastic, especially because we leave the nation. All right. Dog tick, do you know what the diseases that they carry? They, we have the American dog tick listed on our card and the diseases that they oh, carry on here as well. Oh, yes. thank you yeah. very much. Thanks, everybody, so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, very much. That was an excellent presentation and chock full of information. So thank you so much for coming up from Dallas today to join us and educate us today. Um, we're going to take a little five, ten minute break. If you want to stretch your legs, there's food out there. Um, there's lots of material. There's a few um, tick pullers out there. Dr. Cameron has arrived. And so if everyone can come back in here in about five minutes or so, we'll start our next part of our program. Um, again, thank you everyone for coming. And also, I forgot one member of my task force today, Mr. David Teachout, is here down front. And David works outside, and he knows a lot of stuff about um, how to prevent ticks on your property. Everyone on our task force is uh, either a person that has had Lyme disease, or a member of their family has had Lyme disease, or they're a doctor, or someone that's affiliated with it. So we're very grateful to have these folks um, helping the county to provide this information to everyone. Um, also, uh, Commissioner Alan Hall is here today. Thanks, Alan, for coming out. And he told me I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Commissioner Elizabeth Farmer. So thank you for coming, and we'll be back here in about five minutes to hear Dr. Cameron. Thank you.